what is true? In the 1970s, perhaps that was a question that was genuinely asked. People ponder, what is true? And they really want to know. You might think that today people are still not asking that question. Perhaps we think that people have suppressed the truth. But the reality is, people are still curious to know what is true, not that because they don't know, but when they propagate their own agenda to suppress the truth, that is even more evidence that people really, genuinely know what is truth, but now it's been suppressed. Actually, the question what is truth perhaps is the most asked question in the universe. When you ask, when you go to the courtroom, they ask you to solemnly swear, to say nothing but the truth. In other words, they're trying for you to give us exactly what happened. If you can say what is true, then it would help the judge to pass the judgment. What is true? The definition of truth in the ancient Greek is translated as aletheia which means something that is disclosed or something that is unconcealed. The literal meaning of that word, aletheia, is that something is not hidden. It is the state of being evident. It also means actuality or reality. It is the opposite of lethe, which means to be hidden in oblivion or to be concealed, forgetfulness. The Latin Vulgate translates the word truth as veritas, which means something verified, something confirmed. And the English word, which brings it from troth, like betroth, the truth is defined as the quality or the state of being true, a fact or belief that is accepted as true. Truth when we were growing up in Africa, uh, my teacher will tell me that when you define a word, make sure you do not put that word in the definition. If you put the word in the definition, you really have not defined the meaning of the word. The same can be said as defining love. When you define love and you say love is loving people, well, the person is, what does loving people mean? You have not defined what love is. And that song by Johnny Cash talked about a child who sat, a three-year-old boy who is asking his father and saying, what is war? And the father said, it's when people fight and kill each other. But the real answer is when the boy asks, why? War is what happens, but why is the true question as to why do they do these things, and in their lies the word truth. Truth and true, though they are very closely related in meaning, they are not the same. While the truth, or the word true, is that which is in accordance to fact or reality, truth, on the other hand, is what has to do with the quality or the state of something being true. Truth is what takes it to the next level. Truth is what truly matters. For example, in religion or in a religious world, every religion believes that they worship a god. That's a fact. That's a statement that is true. But the truth is that a true religion is the one that would worship the one true God. And that's the truth. The creator of all things, including the gods, are the religion worship. So what is truth? What is the biblical definition of truth? I'm going to give you a very long one, so get your, Bible, uh, your pen and papers ready. It's going to be a long definition. And that is found in John 14, verse 6. Truth is Jesus. Jesus is truth. Either way you want to change it, that's the definition of truth. Jesus himself is the embodiment of truth. In John 14, verse 6, it says, I am the way, the truth. I am the truth 
Period. The word of God. Yes, God says, I and my word are one. They are one. See, we believe this Bible to be true simply because of the one who wrote it. It wasn't Paul. It wasn't Peter. It wasn't Matthew. This is the word of God, inspired word of God. The reason why we can believe this word is not simply because there are evidence in it that points to reality. It is the one who wrote it. We could believe this word because we believe that the, defi the divine being who created the heavens and the earth has revealed himself in this book. When you write a letter in the village back then and you give it to your messenger to go make an announcement in the village square. It isn't about the messenger, neither is it about the letter. It is about the one who has sent the letter. So what is truth? Well, we're going to look at a passage in scripture in John chapter 4. And the reason why I chose this passage is because it is the longest passage where Jesus had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a single person. Every time Jesus had met with someone or talked with them, they were either in a group, even with his disciples. They are either three or two or twelve or seventy-two, however many they were. But this is the longest recorded passage in scripture that Jesus spoke to one person and it's found in John chapter 4 and as we read I want you to follow along on the screen it says therefore when the Lord knew that the Pharisees heard or have heard that Jesus made the, uh, made and baptized more disciples than John though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples did he left Judea and departed again to Galilee but he needed to go through Samaria, so he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot ground of Jacob, the one that he gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who say to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then will you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, and well, uh, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Our fathers worship on this mountain, and you, Jews, say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. Or we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now when the true worshipers will worship the Father in truth and in spirit, or in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him 
must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said, I who speak to you am he. That's a long passage. I'm thankful that you guys are able to bear with my reading abilities and listen to me read that. This passage actually covers a series of aspects in our lives. In fact, it covers every aspect of our lives. In this passage, the conversation of race was brought up, race, and salvation. The conversation about the physical desires and need or want were discussed. Spirituality and our spiritual needs were discussed. Where to worship, who to worship, how to worship. All of that encompasses every aspect of our life. In fact, if you're able to pull up something that I've, we've listed up there that doesn't speak to any aspect of your life, then you can tell me after we're done. <laughs> but let's take a look at race. When the woman pointed out, and you all are familiar with this passage, but I needed to read it so that we can refresh our mind with the progress of events. When the woman pointed out the fact that the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritan, she was stating a true statement. The Jews and the Samaritans were known to have been long rivals and the hatred between them was huge. The Samaritans were Israelites who marched with the Assyrians back in the 721 BC. When the Assyrians invaded the northern Israel, they captivated some, and those who settled in the northern Israel at the time mingled with the Israelites, and that's how you have the Samaritans. Well, in the year 586 BC, when the temple was destroyed in southern uh, Judea, the Babylonians made a way with the Israelites, and when they came back and found out that their Israelite followers are now mingling with Gentiles, that became hatred among them. And that's where you get the hatred for so long that they didn't want to even see each other. So, when this woman saw Jesus talking to her, she brought up the topic about race. We're different people. Why are you speaking to me? But Jesus said something profound. Jesus pointed out the truth that should have been the focus about when we talk about race. Today in our world, race is something that people think it's all about the outward appearance and what you look like on the out, outside. But I love what um, what's his name said about do not judge a person by their outward or color, but their, by their character. And Jesus was focused here not on what race is, but what you ought to look at when you look at a particular race. Therefore, he was pointing to where is salvation going to come from? You see, woman, you've looked at the society and what society has said. That we are not together. But if you're truly concerned about salvation, you would know that salvation is of the Jews. You would have quickly not have judged by the outward appearance. While the woman was focused on what divides them, Jesus was focused on what unites them. Salvation. And that is the truth. Jesus was focused on that that brings us together in him salvation. While there is spiritual division among the world right now, there is a division, and Jesus clearly stated that. We're not all one in this world because of sin. And for those who have not put their trust in Jesus, they are still separated from the truth. Jesus clearly declares that in Luke chapter 12, verses 51 and 53, where he talks about the division of five to Three to two, those who have believed in him and those who are against him. And as we see in our world today, a lot of people are truly against the truth. 
a physical need that was discussed in that passage, the woman was focused on her desire and her thirstiness. She was thirsty and so she came to the well to get water. And Jesus also was thirsty. He was wearied from his journey. And he asked the woman to give him a drink. But the crazy thing that Jesus had to go through Samaria to meet with this woman was that he already had an appointment made up. If you look at verse 4, it says, but he needed to go through Samaria. He needed to go through. Not that he wants to, he has to go through because he has an appointment with that woman. And Jesus always has an appointment with us. He's always waiting just for us to come before him if we're seeking the truth. The truth are found in God's word, the Bible. And the more we look at the Bible on our countertop beside our bed, and every time I just want to pick it up is when I get the chance to. Whenever we open this book, we're revealing God's mind, his thoughts. We're seeing God through his word. Because these words contain God, very God, that reveals himself. And so while this woman, when Jesus went to meet her, he wanted to meet her spiritual need, not her physical need. This woman was focused on her physical need, just like we are sometimes. Sometimes the world is going too fast. That what we are focused on are the things that really doesn't matter. At the, at the long run. It is true that we get hungry and we get thirsty. But we will get thirsty again. It is true that we want a, a small thing and then we get that small thing. We want another bigger thing. It never stops that we seek to get all of that that we can get. But brothers and sisters, let me comfort you to say those things do not really bring satisfaction and that is the truth. But the truth, the, the truth is we seek after those things because of our sinful nature. How about the spiritual need that was discussed in this verse? The spiritual need is that Jesus said to the woman, Woman, there is more than this water that you are seeking to drink. Let me give you something that will create in you a fountain of living water. That would never run dry. Let me meet your spiritual needs. It doesn't mean that you won't have those physical needs. Spiritual need is what provides within us or produces within us peace in the midst of storm. The spiritual need when met is what allows us to continue to move on and forge ahead. And when Jesus told this woman, if you knew the gift of God and he who speak to you to ask you for a drink, you would have asked him to give you living water. Jesus encourages us day by day to look beyond what we see. What truly matters are mostly unseen. When Jesus said this, the woman asked, Are you greater than our father, Jacob, who gave us this well? But Jacob himself needed to drink of this well. You're sitting here, you're asking me for a drink too. You're going to give me a living water? How many times have we looked at people, mostly if pastor is not paid well and we're fortunate enough to be wealthy, and when they come to talk to us, sometimes we look down on them and say, do you really have what it takes to tell me? I mean, just... Take a look at yourself. I mean, you haven't really made it in life, and yet you're going to tell me something. And sometimes, not just the material thing that ponders us into wondering, can you tell me what is true? It could be our status. It could be our age. I mean, the Pharisees said to Jesus, you're not even 50 yet, and you're claiming you see God? They sometimes wonder, who is it that will tell me what is true? And because I'm older or I'm aged, I believe that my experience in life, perhaps, 
makes me know what is truer than you do. Jesus is the truth. Right now, as he told the woman that the living water, the woman, he said that the water that I'll give you will spring into everlasting life. That is enticing. The woman said, give me this water that I may not thirst again. Give me this water that I may not come here to draw again. She was still focused on what is physical and hasn't dived into what is true. When Jesus reveals himself to us, when he reveals himself through his word, or when he has a conversation with an individual in the Bible, he's revealing truth. Everything he says, everything he does is the embodiment of truth. Aside from him, there is no truth. And this woman and us as well are always focused on what is for now and what we see. When this woman was enticed with that, she said in verse 19 through 20, give me, uh, give me this water that I may not thirst again. In verse 15, give me this water that I may not come to this well again. And then Jesus said to her, go call your husband. Jesus said, go and call your husband. And she said, I have no husband. And sometimes the truth does that too. It reveals who we are. The truth reveals every hidden thing about us. It tells us exactly who we are in our past, what we did in hidden closet, what no one can see, the truth knows. The truth sees the heart, very heart. And when Jesus revealed to her who she was, what she's done, boy, this woman was caught on guard. She's like, oh boy, I perceive something. Now, I don't know much about being sarcastic. I know my in-laws are trying to teach me how to be sarcastic because in Africa, we're not sarcastic in any way, shape, or form. It's an American thing, I believe. But now that I am an American... I want to be more like Americans, not forgetting. (laughs) So I'm going to say something that I believe should be sarcastic. If it's not, when I get out there, you can say, oh, Lou, that was a bad sarcasm. Now, when Jesus spoke to this woman and revealed that she's had five husbands, this is what she said. Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. There are two ways she could have said that. She could have said it in a meek way. Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Or she could have said, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. You just don't know where to worship. Because the next thing she said, now that's my sarcastic (laughs) statement. Was that sarcastic? Thank you. She clapped. Some people are better than others. And I thought that you would... Get that real quick when I said that because what she brought up after she said, I perceive you're a prophet, is leading to you, the Jews, said in Jerusalem we must worship. But our fathers tell us on this mountain is where you ought to worship. So if she said it in a sarcastic voice, I perceive you're a prophet. But tell me, why do you guys worship in Jerusalem? If you're a prophet, you should know all things. God should have been revealing things to you. But I want to be more positive about her attitude. Even though she's a Samaritan talking to a Jew, I think their conversation that when Jesus revealed who we are to us, it should scare us. It's a scary thing if I come to my friend here and say, I know what you had for breakfast. (laughs) And I can tell you exactly how you had it. You had toast, and you put some jelly on it. I'm 100% wrong on that one. But someone telling you what you have done in your past, how many husbands you've had, and the one you currently have is not even your husband, reveals your heart, tells you how you feel about that husband that you're with, because she denies she has no husband. That's powerful 
and it should be humbling. When Jesus revealed to this woman who she was, I think it brought out in her a desire to know what is truth all along. She's a Jew. She's a Samaritan Jew. Because she believes that the Messiah is coming. So she's not a Gentile. She's someone who is waiting to see the Messiah come. She believed that that well was Jacob's well. Our father, she said, Jacob. And this woman is asking, our fathers worship on this mountain. And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. This woman wants to know, where do we worship? Where do we worship God? Do we worship him in the temple? Do we worship him where? Tell me. Because I've been dying to know the truth. See, when Jesus pointed out the beauty of truth, it isn't about where you worship. It isn't about the beauty of the walls or what comfortable zone you are in that you worship. It is the heart of worship. Just like our song today talks about, I'm coming back to the heart of worship because it is all about you. Jesus said it would matter it wouldn't matter. Even at the point there, at that day and time, they do worship in Jerusalem because the presence of God was in the holies of holies. But Jesus is saying someone can go even into the presence of God, yet with the wrong heart. Someone can be in that temple, yet having no desire whatsoever to love on God. Someone can come to church, and yet without the desire to know God, or to even want to enjoy his presence. And so where to worship is not the question, but who to worship and how you come to worship. And Jesus addressed that issue as to how do you worship? You worship God. He says, it wouldn't matter on this mountain or in Jerusalem where we worship. For people will begin to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And that's the truth right there is the heart of worship. How to worship is in spirit and in truth. How we reverence God when we come before him. The truth is that we're all gathered here. And people are gathered on Sundays in different churches. But only a few come to truly worship God because we all come for different reasons we all have a reason to come and connect to come and just know but the true reason why we are gathered is to love on each other because of our love for God it is to enjoy the word of God as it reveals to us who we are on dawn before him and as we all come as broken pieces Making that picture, the truth is revealed, and that is Christ in us, the way we love on each other. And true worship happens through the Holy Spirit that resides among us. How do we worship God? Well, first we have to know who we worship, God, His Spirit. And those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, it says that the Spirit of God over, over the deep of the water. God is spirit. What does that mean? Perhaps it's bringing up pictures in your head. Are we worshiping a ghost or something? No. That's not what Jesus is talking about when he said God is spirit. When God is spirit said by Jesus, he's talking about the divinity of God. He's talking about his unlimited ability. He's talking about him not being in just physical, but he's everywhere, every time. That he is the righteous and only God of the universe. Is omnipresent, omniscient, is all-powerful, all-knowing God. To be spirit means to contain the universe with nothing hidden. All of these things were covered in this passage. Race, salvation, physical needs, spiritual needs, 
who to worship, how to worship, where to worship. But aren't we thankful that we as Christians worship the one true God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who is all-powerful, all-knowing. When every religion on earth says look inward, God tells us look outward. Because when you look inward, you will find there is nothing good within us. Our thoughts, our deeds, our words, who we are as a person, we are naturally sinful. We are born with a sinful nature. But when we look outward and we see the cost of sin at the cross, that's what begins to make the changes in us. We are selfish people who want our own way rather than God's way. But when we focus on the cross, it does something powerful. It tells us that, look, this is what the cost of your sin is. And I've paid it all. Christianity tells us in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, it says that any good thing that comes out of us, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. When we now come to Christ, he gives us his Holy Spirit that enables us to live for his good pleasure. That doesn't take away any of our nature. And that's why God gives us the opportunity to come before him and ask for forgiveness. How does truth affect our lives as believers? What does it do? It reminds us of who we once were and who we are now. The truth of the word of God tells us that God has opened our spiritual eyes and mind and has revealed the truth to us, which sets us free. John chapter 8, verse 32, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. You shall know, put that truth and put Jesus there. You shall know Jesus, and Jesus shall set you free. The truth convicts of sin. The truth tells us, look, this is Jesus, perfect, righteous in every aspect. And it tells us who we are, undone. When John ascended or saw this thing in heaven, in Revelation, he said, I'm undone. And I'm in the midst of undone people. So that's what the truth does. It convicts us of sin. The truth also helps us to see what truly matters in life. It helps us to see and to know, even though the outward is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. The truth satisfies our spiritual thirstiness and our hunger. No longer are we merely focused on the water that quenches our physical thirst, but we now focus on the living water that sprung up into everlasting life. The truth is far from the truth. The truth always leads us to a place of worship where we gather and fellowship as believers to edify and encourage one another, to love on one another. The truths give us the hope for the future because when Jesus said in John eleven twenty five, I am the resurrection and the life, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. That is the truth we base our lives on. So when sickness, when all of this thing comes, when the doctors tell us perhaps what could be the end of this, we believe in one thing, that though the physical life may die, yet in the blink of an eye, I'm alive. Truths sometimes are not perceived in us because we are so lied to by the enemy. Have you gone to Vegas and see this magic show where a rabbit is drawn out of the hat? illusion or something. I haven't gone to any of those, but I've seen it on TV. And sometimes the kids are like, he did that? He brought a rabbit out of the hat? That's what the world looks like when the enemy lies to us about what is true and what is not. Those work of heart, they've mastered how to lie to you. That's literally what magic is. I know how to <laughs> lie to you. Because how can a card turn into a rabbit? We know for sure a card will always be a card. And that rabbit was definitely not in that hat. How you did it, 
I don't know. Kudos to you. It produces in us, the truth produces in us, the desire to share Christ with others so that they may believe and be set free as well. We're not shoving down the gospel into people's mind. That's not how we do it. But then how do we do it? How do we let people know that the faith that we now have, which is our faith as believers, is rooted on the true word of God? How do we help them to know the truth so that it can set them free? Do we go about, because I've seen people go around knocking on people's door. Hey, you have a chance. Can I share with you this day? If you don't believe, you're going to die. You see, if you don't believe in Jesus, you will perish. There's a truth to it. That's not how the woman of Samaria, after she encountered a Messiah, shared the gospel. She was sharing the gospel, but this is what she did. She went into the town and she said, come guys. She left the water of her physical need. What she came there to do, it's a mile or two long for her to walk to the well. She left that pot there and she ran. When she ran into town, she said, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. Could this be the Messiah? She even did not say, this is the Messiah. Could this be the Messiah? Come find out for yourself. And sometimes when we share the gospel with people, we say it as though it is our truth. No, that truth is not yours. That truth is God himself. When he opened your eyes, you saw what is truth. And when we proclaim the truth, we do it in meekness and in lowliness because that truth judges the one who speaks it himself. Because we ourselves are undone. And I think that the world today perceives us as Christians as being holier than thou. Because when we bring the truth, we bring it in a way as though it's my truth. No, the woman said, come. Come see the truth. Go and see the truth yourself. In fact, after the people encountered Christ, they said, we no longer believe simply because of what you've said. But we ourselves have tasted and we have seen that the Lord is good. And indeed, this man is the Messiah. When we share the truth with a skeptical world, to a world that is already having a predisposition mindset of what they believe to be true, how do we do that in a way that is loving in a way that they themselves have the opportunity to question the Bible. Because when curiosity happens in us, God used those curiosity to reveal the truth. In fact, the most time that I grew up, as I grew up in God's Word, I think it was most times when I was curious. So where does life come from? Who are we? Why are we here? What is the purpose of life? I grew because as I opened the word of God, I began to see that it testified to every aspect of what is true. And as the world today is relatively defining what is true, how would we come alongside them to point them to Christ? How is God calling you to point others to Christ and say, I am the truth the way and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And as we do that, we can pray that God will help us to point people to the truth. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, King of glory, oh God, we are undone people. And every time we open your word, we see your truth. And your truth is pure, it's righteous and holy. It reveals to us that we are undone. Lord, would you help us that with meekness and with humble to come alongside the world to reveal and point them to the truth, which is you. Lord, we thank you because you have set us free. We thank you for loving us the way that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.